Hello everyone, how are you doing? My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. Welcome new subscribers. Welcome subscribers. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing our videos. Uh, like I said before, my name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. I run the Chemistry Channel. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I was looking through my videos and I was like, have I ever did a video just on the ancestors and just my experience with the ancestors and just talked about ancestral veneration? And I said, no, I, I looked through that. I was like, no, I've never done that. But I've had, I have referred you to books to help you work closer with the ancestors, but I've never just discussed ancestral veneration. So today we're going to talk about ancestral veneration, uh, what it is, just the basic. Okay, and then I might refer you to some more books uh, if you want to get that started. All right, so let's talk about ancestral veneration. Ancestral veneration is one's ancestors based on love and respect for the deceased. In some cultures, it is related to the beliefs that the dead have the continued existence and may possess the ability to influence the fortune of the living. Some groups venerate the direct familiar ancestors. Certain sects and religions, in particular, particular the Roman Catholic Church, venerate saints and intercessors with God, as well as pray for the departed souls. Ancestors' veneration is to ensure ancestors' continue well-being and positive disposition toward the living, and sometimes ask for special favors or assistance. So let me stop there. Uh, there's different... Uh, when I say different levels of ancestors that we do honor, and we see that in our everyday life when you see these president birthdays such as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, that is a sort of veneration of the dead. Uh, as, and we have Martin Luther King birthday coming up. That's a veneration of the dead. So we do it unconsciously, uh, whether you knew, know that or not. And those are uh, the civil rights ancestors are those leader ancestors that we call upon when we need it, we need the guidance on leading. So you can call on those ancestors as well. And we do that every time we honor that, that, that day. All right. So I wanted to make that clear and just giving you an example of ancestral veneration for those of you that say, Oh, I don't like, you know, that's evil or whatever, whatever. That's not right. We do it. You know, you can't, you unconsciously do it. And I bet many of you did not look at it from that standpoint until I made that point. All right. So we do it all the time. There's nothing bad or evil about it. It's, it's we're respecting the dead, the dead. Ancestor reverence is not the same as the worship of, uh, of a deity or deities. In some afro diasporic cultures, ancestors are seen as being able to intercede on behalf of the living, often as messengers between the human and the God, humans and the gods. As spirits who were once human themselves, they are seen as being better to able to understand human needs than would a divine being. And so what these, what ancestors do, they, they intercede, they're intercessors because they understand the language of spirit and because they understand the human experience, they can better serve our needs and intercede with us. That's why a lot of our grandparents, uh, a lot of our loved ones are our spirit guides. We have a team of spirit guides that, uh, that form different, uh, they, they perform different functions in our lives. And that's for a good reason, because all our needs, uh, that way they meet all our needs. But when you don't call on them and you're not aware of them, you can't get the benefit of really, uh, you can't really get the benefit of the relationship with your spirit guides. That's why, you know, this is important as well. Uh, ancestral veneration is prevalent throughout Africa and serves as the basis of many religions. It is often augmented by a belief in a supreme being, but prayers and sacrifices or offerings are usually offered to the ancestors or some ancestors that may have descended becoming a kind of minor deity. Uh, you see that with Shango. 
one of the Orisha. He was once a king. Now he's venerated as a deity. You can also see that we can say that about Martin Luther King. You know, he is a sort of deity now because he was, he was a philanthropy. Uh, he did a lot of stuff for the um, for the people. So now he's nationally honored. The same thing with Shango when you see in these deities. I just wanted to give you an example of that. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, these leaders, they kind of be, we call them icons today. All right. But let me go on. Uh, ancestors veneration remains among many Africans sometimes practiced alongside their uh, uh, later their adopted religions. So you still got, because you have some Haitians that's Catholic, but they still honor the ancestors. You see what I'm saying? So you have Catholics, they still practice their religion, but they still honor the saints. It's, you know, they still honor their ancestors. The same thing. All right, so it's still going on, whether you know it or not. But now that I'm speaking on it, you are aware of it. The purpose of ancestor veneration is not to ask for favors, but to do one's general generational duty. It is a duty because you don't know if you need to do some healing uh, with your ancestors. You don't know if they need to be elevated. You know, so some of us that don't have any clue about our ancestors and no one is under the ancestors, it is our gener generational duty to do that. All right. Some cultures believe their ancestors actually need to be provided for by their descendants and their practices include offerings of food and other provisions. When the spirits see you taking control of your life and handling your business to make things happen, they follow your example. All right. So that's a lot of too why I emphasize inner work, especially for those that have dysfunctional families. Uh, there's some generational patterns going on in there so it's very important that you get yourself balanced so you can start correcting that dna but this will makes this is going to make more sense as i move on with my research uh it will require you to be firm and confident it will require you to address karmic issues that may be plaguing your life or your family all right so being balanced too because we have some ancestors that are not so good. And if you're not balanced, those ancestors can come in and attach, attach to you and just wreak havoc in your life. If you don't have your, your mind, your body, and your spirit in balance, that's what will happen. All right, so make sure that you're, you're ready to build on your character as well when you start developing uh, this relationship with your family. Uh, another book good to read, uh, is the soul path to Orisha. She talks about the ancestor is, is like picking weeds out of a garden. And we take our time connecting with some of these ancestors that were not so savory people and start elevating them through our relationships with them. All right. Uh, and I'll go over some book reviews with you when I finish this video, uh, when I finish this research paper. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you want to do is call on the highest power possible. This can be the creator, God. This can be the Orisha or your higher uh, Ori or higher self. This can be other higher vibrational ancestors, deities, divinities, or forces that have the power over the dead, keeping them in line and in check respectfully. All right, so that's one thing. When I start working with my ancestors, um, it took a while. I knew something was going on with them. I knew that they needed something, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, when I read that book, Ancestors Path, if you're interested in working with your ancestors, you want full details of it, go look at uh, the book review book review I did on Ancestors Path by uh, Ala Dokun. And um, it's a it's an electronic book. All right, but it's, if you're interested in, I got the book from Amazon, but, you know, if you, you want to just check out the book review before you buy the book, go look at that video. All right, so I was led to do a prayer to the Orishas before I uh, went any further. Before I went any further with the ancestors, I had to go and do a prayer 
with the Orishas. They urged me to do that. And I saw a significant difference uh, in the energy that I was feeling, even with them. I felt a little elevation. And and that's after I ran into that book, Ancestors Path, after I read that book. Because, again, I go through that. I'll go through how they communicate with you in a minute. But, again, I was urged to, to read that book. And after I read that book and I, I uh, developed a ritual, learned a ritual to honor the Orishas, um, I, I said, a, you know, went out and said a couple of prayers to elevate them. And I, that's, you know, that's when I was telling you guys I had that supernatural experience when I went out there to do that ritual uh, for the ancestors. All right. Uh, ancestor trauma is trauma is very real. And many of us, of us suffer from this energy coming from our genes every day in some kind of way. There are many ways to counteract the pitfalls. The simplest way to decide to break the negative patterns plaguing your life or your family is to correct those patterns. This works well for many people. It's also important to teach your children to break the patterns as well. So uh, when I found out about my trauma, you know, uh, and I, I think I found, yeah, did I find out about that before or after? I think I found out uh, about the trauma after I did the ritual. Yeah, I found out after, about the trauma after I did the ritual. Uh, I really started looking at the family dynamics. And then it made sense why the ancestors had pushed me to do that ritual. All right. And now that I've done that ritual, I do it on several occasions. I do it on several occasions, really once a week. I go to my ancestors' uh, altar, and I'm always doing a healing prayer for them because I know they need it, all right? So you'll find that as well. And for those of you that have ancestors, you know, you know they're still set, uh, suffering, family that's still suffering from ancestor trauma or uh, those genetic energy patterns that, that just be wreaking havoc on the whole family. You know, you got a generation of women that don't, don't get married or you got a generation of people that's going back and forth to jail or you got a generation of mothers and daughters not getting along, you know, things like that. If you see any type of patterns in, in that divorces and things like that, then there's there's there are some there's some any inner work that you need to do. That's probably been passed on to you that you you're unconscious of. and You're not even looking at it. Uh, and that's how the ancestors dealt with me. Ancestors can communicate to us uh, in dreams. For those of you who are wondering, hey, how do they communicate with us? How do I communicate with the ancestors? Well, they communicate with us through dreams, visions, and journeying. I have a journeying uh, meditation uh, called Ancestral Alignment. If you're interested in journeying to the world uh, realm of the ancestors, I suggest you go check out that video. You know, I've got really good feedback from the video. I try my best to make it as authentic as possible. So go check out the Ancestral Alignment video, uh, Meditation Journey, you know, because I do a lot of journeying with the ancestors. It's not until I start doing the healing on myself, the ancestors reveal my spiritual path to me. You know, it's something. Once I really start being, uh, start doing the healing work on myself, they start revealing my purpose more and more and more. You know, it's like little breadcrumbs. I, I've been having little breadcrumbs, just following the spirit, following the ancestors. And, you know, they just teach me like that because that's the best way for me to learn. You know, that's how they deal with me. All right. Um. It is, it is an experimental process involving access into the realm of the psyche and the unconscious where we set intentions to ask for help or guidance with the purpose of bringing, bringing this new wisdom back into the conscious realm. So I've done this with the Orishas. I bought information back from the Orishas. I've connected with the ancestors uh, with my higher power, taking my higher power with me. And coming up with a uh, life plan for me. So I've, I've, I've visited the ancestors on quite occasions uh, doing the journey work. All right. 
uh, let's go on. It may take a few days or even weeks for you to really feel the effects or the presence of your ancestors. Making frequent offerings and praying at the altar regularly may help strengthen the connection more quickly. It does take energy to cross the veil or communicate in uh, to the physical realm. The offerings, uh, the water, foods, and, and alcohol provide energetic sustenance that helps give the spirits energy for communication. Okay, and you want to approach them like you do any other relationship. Uh, I wanted to iterate something right here. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. You know, for me, I had immediate results because some of our ancestors are right there waiting on us. They're right there, you know, because they are part of us. So they're right there waiting on us and they're ready to serve us. So I had immediate results uh, once I started talking to my ancestors, they started making things happen in my life. All right. Uh, some people I've met, some people that have a strong connection with the ancestors move stuff, you know, and it scares the hell out of them because the, the connection is so strong. Uh, you know, so if, if you're one of those types, you can also ask the ancestor to be more gentle with you when you're communicating with them. You know, and you won't have such an intense uh, reaction when you see something like that. Uh, I had one lady said her uh, when she offered alcohol to her ancestors, she can actually she could see it uh, evaporate. She can actually see them drink it. It just disappears as she put it when she puts it on the altar. So you know, all of us have a different. Many of us have had a different experience of how the uh, ancestors would communicate with us. All right. Checking in, checking in on them frequently, greeting them, asking them how they're doing, if they need anything or have anything to say before you launch into talking about yourself and your needs is always a great etiquette with the living and the dead alike. So you're at your altar. And for me, when I'm at my altar and I'm trying to communicate with the ancestors and I'm just sitting there just in a meditative mode, so to speak, uh, the way I can tell my ancestors that are that's trying to connect with me. If I see the incense go towards the candle, I know the ancestors are trying to communicate with me. Uh, if I hear the candle crackling, you might making a popping crackling noise, I know that's the ancestors trying to communicate with me. Do I always understand the communication? No. That's when I go in and I ask the ancestors what are they trying to tell me. You know, I may not find out what they're trying to tell me or communicate with me right then and there. But once I leave and I start listening to other people's conversations and, uh, you know, coming in contact with other things, I usually get messages like that uh, from them. You know, my environment, just our environment, the spirit is always trying to speak to us through our environment all the time. So you just got to keep your eyes open uh, for that. Once you've asked your ancestors for help, something for something, be on the lookout for the answers, book recommendations, like I said, TV programs, media, snippets overhead of overhead conversations that sound just for you. You may notice that your ancestors prefer a commu uh, prefer to communicate a certain way, maybe through random songs on the radio. I've had that to happen to me too. So just be on the lookout on how they communicate with you. Uh, creating an ancestor altar is one of the one of the most rewarding rituals you can engage in for making intentional contact and, and reverence. An altar can be as simple and as small as you desire, or as large or complex as you feel it needs to be. Some choose to have a temporary altar at certain times of the year. So you'll see that at Sawan and the Day of the Dead, just certain times of, of the year, people will erect the altar and um under the ancestors or you see people that don't erect the altar they'll just go out to the cemetery and talk to their ancestors that way uh you know whatever works for you whatever feels right for you because they're always with us anyway uh, but i think it's a good idea to if you are communicating with them give them offerings you know uh, give an offering to them if you are in communication and they are helping you you want to show your appreciation in some type of way all right uh, Let's see. Trust your intuition as you begin the process of creating an altar. 
ancestor altar or how you want to communicate with your ancestors basis things you need uh if you're going to create an altar you're going to need photos do not mix the uh the photos of the living with the dead if you got a uh, a picture of your dead loved one let it be just that dead loved one not the living with the dead on the altar don't do that another thing do not put your altar in your bedroom all right you don't want to be it's like disrespecting your ancestor you're walking around naked you're probably having sex in your room. It's just like a disrespect to your ancestor because your ancestor is like, I mean, your altar is like a house. It it, it houses your ancestors, okay? It's a place, a, a space for them to get energy, you know? So be respectful. Do not put it, I wouldn't advise you to put it in your bedroom. Put it in a private space as you can. If you if it's a place where you you uh there there is no eyes on it, that can be good as well. A little cabinet, you know, any, you know, just do what what the ancestors move you to do. All right. Uh but the uh, the those other two do not do that. All right. No living, no pictures with the living. Uh and do not put the ancestors altar in your room all right let's see you can put um uh, any objects that belong to the dead such as the jewelry vases trinkets of any kind that may have been imbued with their energy when they were alive depending on the season you want to add flowers leaves stones adornments that reflect the season this will help create a connection that acknowledges the here and now. All right, so if you're interested in uh, working with the ancestors, you know, I would say get this book, Grasping the Root of Divine Power. This will help keep your ancestors in check. There are some Orisha prayers in here, along with ancestral prayers. So that that this book will help you with that. Uh, if you want to do some healing with the ancestral mothers in your family, this is a good book for that. There are some prayers in here for that, helping you uh, connect with the divine, divine feminine, the Arisha divine, divine feminine. Very good book. Uh, and then the other book is Ancestors Path to Aladokun. I did a book review on that. Uh, if you're interested in the book, go look at the book review and then you can decide whether or not you want to purchase the book. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped you. And I thank you so much for being here with me today. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you. Peace.